colleague and friend, uh, Professor Satyam Suvas. Satyam uh, is currently the chair of materials engineering, and of course, he's a professor of materials engineering at IIC Bangalore. Uh, he uh, did his PhD at IIT Kanpur in materials and metallurgical engineering. And he worked in a number of places, including DMRL, D Defense Metallurgical Re Research Lab at Hyderabad, University of Lorraine in France, and RWTH Aachen, which is very well known for manufacturing in Germany before joining IISC. His specialization includes materials processing, microstructural engineering, and mechanical behavior of materials. He has, of course, a very substantial set of publications, 300 research papers. He's a Humboldt Fellow. Uh, he also received the Friedrich Wilhelm Bessel Award by the Humboldt Foundation Germany. He is also the awardee for the Metallurgist of the Year 2012 by the Ministry of Steel and Eminent Engineering Personality of the Year 2014 by the Institution of Engineers. He is, of course, a fellow of the Indian National Academy of Engineering and also National Academy of Sciences India. So uh, I now uh, request my colleague to give his address. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Amresh Chakravarti, for this uh, opportunity for nice introduction. And uh, all of you, including Mr. And of course, if I may interrupt for a second, Professor Satyam is also an associate uh, faculty at the Center for Product Design and Manufacturing. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I, I must thank Mr. Uh, Dr. Srinivas Madhusudan uh, K for uh, inviting and Professor Chakravarti for giving this opportunity. So I will. Uh, I I was not aware uh, till the till I saw the notice that this was for Ajadi Kamrit Mahotsav. So this is anyway. Uh, this is uh, done for all the all all the seminar series uh, conducted through government of India institutions. So and it's very relevant because manufacturing is the major impetus of the country for Atmanirbhar Bharat. So I think uh, what I am going to talk is something about additive manufacturing, uh, an area where uh, we have been working and particularly my work related to CPDM is in the area of additive manufacturing. Uh, in this area, let me first share my slides. So uh, this this uh, this topic is uh, a very very fertile topic for material scientists, and that is why pe many people who did not work on additive manufacturing have uh, started working on additive manufacturing uh, since past uh, several years. Uh, this has immense technological importance. And besides, there is a lot of science in it. It goes a lot, very well with the economics of the country and the world. So therefore, uh, it's a topic worth research by an academician uh, to be practiced by an industrialist and to be learned because it may lead to many other things, many other technologies for future. So. Uh, the, the presentation that I am going to give today has I have covered some basic aspects of uh, additive manufacturing because not everybody works in additive manufacturing. So I thought it's better to start with and then I will show some of the work that we have done. And uh, we have been collaborating with uh, several colleagues uh, in India and abroad. So uh, the work that I'm going to show here is uh, primarily collaborated by Professor Kaushik Chatterjee, Professor Deepankar Banerjee, Dr. Deepa Srinivasan, and uh, from Germany, uh, Dr. Alexander Krishner and Dr. Burkhard Kloden. And the students who were involved in these works were Vik RJ Vikram, Deepak, Sumit Bahal, and Saurabh Gupta. So great. So just uh, this may be very uh, uh, preliminary set of knowledge for uh, those who are working in this field and people might have seen these slides uh, several times, these pictures, but just for the continuity, I just 
uh, I'm just introducing the process. Additive manufacturing means the method of manufacturing parts from powders, wires and sheets. So it is say uh, bottom up process. So we have a smaller uh, elements and then from there we build parts. It is done in layer by layer manner. Uh, the process can be done through melting, which is mostly done, but it also has a variant uh, which where we don't go to the melting point and it is done in a solid state manner. The advantage of the process is that here uh, one can take inputs from the design and directly make the parts as per the design, while in other cases where we have bulk materials, we have to do processing, we have to have dyes, punches, molds, uh, then we can make a shape and then most of the time such things are made by machining processes. So that also consumes a lot of material and there is a wastage component to it. While additive manufacturing, once practiced ideally, does not require any secondary process. Uh, though, though it's an ideal proposition, but normally the concept is that you just directly build components from design. And this, this provides a new paradigm for design and production of high performance components. So I to give you an example that there are at least uh, in aerospace sector, people have uh, uh, embraced it very strongly just to integrate uh, several small components. So, uh, in fact, I will just uh, tell you something which uh, probably was, uh, uh, which I'm not going to show as a technical part, that uh, in, in 2006, we had a pr uh, program from Boeing. And in that project, uh, some people have projected a process that involves powder-based methods, not additive manufacturing, but spray forming, which is also in a way uh, some something related to additive manufacturing and in those days uh, the team of Boeing uh, uh, completely rejected any component that was processed from powder metallurgy root considering the integrity. Ten years down the line probably Boeing is the biggest subscriber of additively manufactured parts because I had a discussion with the Boeing uh, senior personnel uh, in one-to-one -one discussion, they said that it goes very well with the economics and precisely because uh, they could integrate many small parts which were outsourced to different places and then they were integrated and there was lots of uh, uh, manual involvement in that, lots of uh, matching requirements, integration issues, time, all that were taken care by additive manufacturing. So I must say that additive manufacturing serves the purpose of integration of larger parts. That is, as of now, the claim to fame of additive manufacturing, uh, as I understand. A uh, second important thing which is shown here uh, for biomedical components, here uh, the it goes with the anatomy of human body. Like for example, if somebody has a fracture, the, the plate required or, or the implant required in his or her body may be different from the implant that is required for somebody else, depending on the anatomy of the human body as well as the, the nature of fracture. So these things can be designed and custom made because if somebody buys it from a known source, then it will require more time, more, and, and it may lead to less perfection than what it is intended for. So therefore, it, biomedical sector is a big, is a very big subscriber of this concept other than, edit, other than aerospace sector. And of course, space sector, NASA, also is, is, is quite deep into it. In fact, I would say that the entire metal industry is almost uh, shifted towards additive manufacturing. Traditional companies like Tata Steel in India has a very strong additive manufacturing drive. 
though they are they are primarily steel makers but they are into the uh, into the technology so that this can be sooner or later can be uh, thought of as alternate to conventional steel making process so uh, the process in brief i will tell that uh, there are uh, the processes can be classified into two types i am giving only broad introduction so one is uh, directed energy deposition based methods uh, there a powder is fed from a hopper and then there is a laser it is melted by a laser as as given here and then it is deposited on a substrate uh, to to give the shape based on and the movement of this laser is uh, is is based on the geometry that is fed uh, movement of the whole beam is uh, that is what it guides the geometry of the part then uh, another uh, parallel equally popular method is uh, selective laser melting process where one makes a powder bed and again uh, by moving the laser uh, source one just acquires or makes it uh, move in such a way in a guided manner so that a part is produced so in this process the disadvantage is we have lots of redundant powder left which has to be reused third process does not use laser it is electron beam based process but it is very similar to uh, selective laser melting process where instead of laser electron beam is used to melt it has uh, some uh, advantages because the process can be used at higher temperatures and many uh, many components or many materials which are susceptible to hot cracking can be taken care by electron beam melting methods so the process the methodology and electron beam metal interaction is the guiding factor for that so this is these are primarily there are three methods there are other methods which are coming up like binder jetting and other so i am not going too much into detail and i must tell that my entire uh, and presentation today is based on metal additive manufacturing i have not covered uh, polymer and other materials or ceramic additive manufacturing but the technology is equally applicable to both and equally uh, equally challenging and rewarding for other materials as well uh, in fact uh, in fact uh, yesterday's news i have seen it is more used in, it, it has been used in civil engineering and apparently iit madras is going to have a building completely made by uh, additive manufacturing or what is called 3d printing by the way 3d printing and additive manufacturing though there are subtle differences but they are used mostly in a synonymous manner so that is uh, what uh, iit madras is going to build a structure and i saw the news that 3d printed uh, building is coming up the first 3d printed building will come in iit madras campus well here uh, just uh, let us look into the right side of this uh, slide where uh, it has shown that this of course these projections are uh, i don't know how recent they, they, this is this is from 2016 to 2017 of course these things always keep on modifying so based on this projection it's a huge market and in 2027 we are just in the middle of it we are 2021 so we have just completed 5 years and almost 6 more years are there so we could it's a good to examine where we have come up to and then uh, but but there is no doubt that the there is a very strong trend of growth in additive sector so it's a projected to be a 12 billion dollar market and you could see that there is also a constant increase in metal additive the blue one in, indicates metal additive here and it it seems to saturate uh, uh, in 2000 say 26 27 but i think we are still far from there so and and i'm pretty sure these trends will change because uh, these trends are projected and as and when uh, things new things come up new technology comes up new solutions to the problems come up uh, things uh, take up in a different uh, trend so uh, again so basically the as i mentioned in the last slide there are two types of processes one is powder bed based fusion and it is selective laser melting di direct direct 
laser metal laser sintering uh, selective laser melting uh, based selective laser sintering and then ebm all these things can give rise to uh, high accuracy and details uh, details of the components fully dense part fully dense means whatever is within the process limitations we, we are going to talk about the limitations a bit in more detail and of course the property one thing i must tell you the property of additively manufactured parts have been surprisingly better in many cases because most of the cases with our general perception or general metallurgical guidelines they should be at the most equal to the uh, conventionally processed material by rot processing or by casting but in surprisingly in many cases the property come out to be better i will i will discuss uh, a bit on that the advantages overall advantages of additive is uh, freedom of design complexity for free right and uh, freedom of design complexity for free uh, there is no uh, nothing else like for example if one has to fabricate a complicated uh, metal part the machining is it, it, it can be a nightmare of a part but here one can have accurate design complexity design in in a complex structure and then uh, there is uh, elimination of tooling of course because tool not only making tools the maintenance of tool refurbishing of tools all these things are uh, very important and energy and as resource consuming thing for the industry and then lightweight designs can be made lightweight designs in the sense that we we know how much thickness particularly the dimensions thicknesses other things we can we can control and then uh, of course uh, there is a chemistry also that we can control in a better way as it is seen here uh, and and then of course there are several production steps that can be minimized but there are disadvantages as well because this has slow build rates and high production cost because always remember there are two aspects one is we have to make the feed stock that itself is a process and then from feed stock we build the component so there is a production cost involved and it is slightly slower than already well established process flow line for a component right so because there are already established process flow lines or process uh, uh, chain for for any component there additive processes uh, compared to that it can it can have a uh, slightly expensive uh, proposition but again the costs are also dependent on the volume of production if uh, somebody goes more and more additive more components are required then the cost will automatically come down and then process flow chains will be established then that will help in reducing the cost right then it's a discontinuous process uh, and but but again discontinuous process can also be made continuous be discontinuous because we just use one source of laser but if there are multiple sources used when uh, we think of those niche products which require large volumes and then the costs basic investment costs come down then these things can be taken care component size is a limitation now but slowly this is coming out uh, coming out to be a, a, a solve problem because people are coming up with a robot based uh, uh, based additive manufacturing processes but the most crucial thing on which we are really going to work on or discuss is powder availability where to get the powders from and uh, all the people who have studied metallurgy particularly there is a subject called powder metallurgy we all know that getting powders from all the metals is not an easy task and getting alloy powders is even more difficult therefore i will tell you the additive manufacturing is so far limited to materials or metals or alloys which are which you can count on fingers i can tell you ti64 titanium 6 aluminum 4 vanadium in conel 718 ss316l and then some tool steels and then people are now trying to work out and break these barriers of powder limitation and where are the limitations because to make powders from all the materials 
is very difficult. So one of the important process parameter or influencing process parameter is powder stock. So feedstock quality that includes that is powder, shape, size distribution, surface morphology, composition, amount of internal porosity. This all these factors they decide flowability and apparent density and we need fully dense material for any engineering application. We can't afford to have pores or holes because they will uh, they will lead to some kind of a, uh, crack in, in due, due service due course of service now the shape and size distributions are important because for all powder bed processes we need a fully dense packing and there has been enough research done as far as the densification by packing is concerned there has to be a size distribution it has to be a Gaussian size distribution kind of thing where uh, where uh, the packing density is decided by the size, the gradation in size, like larger size balls. Uh, we can imagine from this point of view that a larger size balls, if we pack, there are voids left inside it. So to fill these voids, we need to have a sec other, uh, other size of balls that can fit into those voids and again there will be voids left so we need third size of uh, balls to fill in so to get a completely dense packing of powders as required for mostly for powder bed processes we require an appropriate size distribution and i can tell you as on date even very good industries uh, i'm not talking about very niche industries but most of the cases which where people are using a powder bed process, they do not take into account of uh, requ exact requirement of size distribution. And that's the reason most of the cases people are ending up with uh, some amount of porosity. So another thing is shape. So shape people have accepted now that spherical powders are the most suitable one. And in fact, uh, there is a, also a thumb rule that about 40 micron diameter powders are the best suitable ones for, for SLM process, selective laser melting process. If, if we go to any SLM shop, uh, they will say, okay, we need 40 micron spherical powders. But why do we need a sharp size, this, uh, size uh, for powders? Nobody knows because this has to be optimized and a great deal of research is required. In fact, research is already done. The data has to be extracted and uh, we have to educate people or, 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 or people have to probably modify it as per the requirements of powder bed so that they can get the most dense size distribution. So this is for green pack, right? When, when we make the powder bed, but the main issue comes is uh, is the internal porosity so when we are making powders based on the processes that we uh, use to make powder in that case we can have internal porosity and slight deviation in geometry of the powder for example if we get powders from gas atomization rotary atomization then powders which are the most common and economically feasible processes gas atomization and rotary atomization there the powders are irregular shape and there is a satellite formation which i will show you in the in the next slide uh, how one small, small powders get deposited on the powder then there are other processes that plasma which are a little complicated and used only for selected uh, materials like titanium alloys and other things where uh, gas atomization and rotary, rotary atomization are not more, not suitable ones. So there plasma rotating electrode process and plasma atomization processes are used. Here one can get highly spherical and smooth powder and low extent of satellite formation. And this is uh, expensive proposition. So that adds to the cost of the process. Then uh, in all these processes, we have inevitably gases trapped inside the uh, particle itself like when the sphere forms there, there are uh, there are inevitably gases trapped inside so because during the rapid solidification case uh, there are it, it is never done in vacuum it is always done in gaseous atmosphere and then there are uh, 
uh, some entrapped gases uh, when, when the solidification takes place. So, so th those things have to be taken into account. What happens that such powders, when we do conventional powder metallurgy process, there is a process called grinding. And the grinding operations normally fractures these uh, particles and makes it a fully dense process. But in additive, we have just a bed, a packing of the bed. And then after that, we try to melt it. So these gases, somehow they do not find a way to escape. So they, they remain there. Then other important parameter is the energy source that is uh, that is in the process where laser power, uh, where energy density, laser energy density is important, laser power, hatch distance is important, layer thickness of the powder, scan speed, all these things are important. And uh, overall volumetric energy density is a function of all. It is given by this formula called the total energy density is given by uh, laser power div divided by uh, the velocity, the scan speed, uh, times hatch distance and time thickness of the layer thickness of the powder. So this, this, is, this gives you volumetric energy density and this serves as an important parameter in deciding many things in this. And of course the solidification conditions, right? So when, the, when it is melted after that, when it is cooled, what is the temperature gradient under what condition you are cooling, whether controlling is done during cooling or not, the rate at which solidification is taking place and of course the chemical composition because in metallurgy there is a very important term called segregation and so whether it, the second element which is inevitably either intentionally or unintentionally present in the material where is it sitting whether it is sitting at the grain boundary or grain interior or it is or it is uniformly distributed that makes a lot of difference in the in the properties of the uh, finally processed product so I was just telling about the satellite powders. So this is the satellite. So we have a powder and on, on the surface of which we have got a small spheres here. So these, these, these are, uh, this creates some problem in terms of packing. And then uh, this is another, another way of uh, doing where the, there is a powder produced in uneven shape. It's not very spherical. So this, this type of powder, which is spherical is considered that uh, the best for, for packing, but I must tell that this is also a very preliminary study uh, which leads to, which, which tells that this is the best, this provides the best packing and uh, there are several works going on which, uh, which will eventually come out and, and lead to the solution for the best packing and best optimization of size distribution. Right, so this is uh, the, the this gas atomized and rotary atomized and prep processes. These are the size of powders that you get. Another thing is one has to really optimize by uh, by electron microscopes. Otherwise, you won't be able to distinguish. Like for example, uh, the, there is very little distinction if one examines the powder by optical methods. Uh, very fine distinctions are there. So one has to really examine it by electron microscope to see. Uh, what is the powder uh, size and morphology here? Like for example, here this powder is also appearing as a circular or little bit elliptically elliptical over here, but it is actually elliptical and it will create a havoc in terms of densification. Now this is what is the powders uh, powder and the process energy part we have already said. How do we melt? It? How do we uh, design our chamber? For, for doing additive manufacturing, like chamber atmosphere, whether inert gas or vacuum is used, right? So for different processes, different conditions are used. So this is uh, this is what it is given here. I'm not going to read it out. But the more important thing, which is not being practiced, at least at industrial scale, is a scan strategy. So whether one is using, using a direct, th this way of uh, scanning or the alternate way of scanning, or one can, divide the total scan area into different scan uh, scan uh, methods, scan contours, and all these things, actually they all influence the type of residual stresses that are generated in the formed part. And this is, uh, this is very important and uh, th this has to be optimized again. So this, uh, the, there is a relationship between applied heat source power and heat source velocity 
and this provides a key parameter for powder bed fusion as well as directed energy deposition processes. So this has to be optimized in a similar way as a heat power source and velocity has to be optimized. So all these are that provides a number of variables to be used. Now I will just give you a very brief example which always attracts uh, me as a metallurgist that there is a domain here, right? If we plot the scan speed versus beam power, uh, there is a narrow domain where we get the best uh, conditions of additive manufacturing and most sound uh, product. If we are on one side of it, there is a keyhole formation. What is a keyhole? I will show you in a minute. And then the other side, it, it helps with the melt ball formation and delamination. So this is the melt ball formation and delamination kind of uh, defects that come in. So this is on, uh, in, in the conditions where we have a very high scan speed and a slightly lower beam powers. There is a re range in which there is no melting uh, that takes place. So, uh, so we have to really hit into this area in terms of a choice of beam power and scan speed. And this has to be really done. This is just thinking the optimization of the build, build product. I'm not talking about microstructural optimization, which is again the next level of optimization. And that really essentially important, that is essentially important for tailoring the desirable property of the material. So that that is that requires another optimization of a similar type. So I will I will show you that uh, in a short while. So for example, here just quickly I will you can have a look that just by changing the scanning speed, the level of porosity has changed substantially from here to here. So just four times uh, one for 250 to 1000 uh, millimeter per second if uh, scanning speed has been changed. So for a higher scanning speed, a lot of porosity has come in. Similarly, laser power, if suppose one increases the laser power at a higher laser power, there are less porosity at lower laser power, there is more porosity. So this is what it is. And if so, what we require is to generate a map of laser scan speed and laser energy and see where we get the most optimal condition or the tolerable level of porosity because we, we also have to optimize the cost because if we go for a very high energy laser, then it will increase the cost and probably sometimes it may become techno commercially non feasible. So we have to really take into account about the optimization of porosity where what is the tolerance level again that requires another set of investigation that will tell on a statistical manner, what is the tolerable level of porosity for different components? Like suppose some, some component is subjected to uh, so cyclic loading. What is the tolerance level? Somebody, some component is subjected to impact loading. What is the tolerance level? All these things have to be optimized. So a lot of challenges are there. Generally, uh, for the same stand speed, higher power leads to reduced porosity. For the same power, higher scan, uh, higher scan speed leads to higher porosity. So these are some observations that have been made by various investigations. And now there are n number of reviews published on that. Now porosities can be of two types. So one, one is for the porosity that comes because of lack of fusion or gas induced porosity. And so here we can see that if there is an insufficient energy input, then we get unmelted regions because the melt pool has this shape generally this is this has also been modeled and in also in our our group and here this is the weld metal and this is the melt pool and slowly as as it advances the weld metal increases but there is always an unmelted region below this and in different regions and this lack of fusion porosities comes here then there is uh, another extreme where there is the excessive energy as i have shown in the previous slide, then there is a keyhole type of defects form, uh, which is which are basically in this condition, there is epitaxial or oriented growth, while in this case, the growth is non epitaxial or non oriented. So all these things uh, can lead to uh, some kind of a defects which we have to uh, get rid of, right? Then comes um, beam powder interaction. So beam powder interaction uh, depends on the kind of sources that we use, 
right? Particularly for, there are four types. One is spatter ejection, that, uh, that is related to high energy beam, localized boiling, and the energy of the ejected particle overcomes the surface tension. So in that case, spatter ejection takes place, then electrostatic repulsion acts uh, for the case of particularly when when e beam powders e, e beam processes are being used and then that leads to kind of a localized sintering and uh, there is a diffused beam and that leads to localized sintering then there is a kinetic recoil of powders during the ed process and then there is enhanced convection of uh, powder in the gas stream so I, particularly these are many of these defects are related to e beam processes because e-beam, uh, if, if suppose somebody has done the experience of e-beam, there is always a powder that comes out, right, uh, out of uh, the process. So uh, powder bed is no more uh, very smooth in, in, the, in that case. So these parameters have to be optimized so that uh, there is a reduced electrical charge built up because here there is the interaction between the incoming electrons and the electron of the metal and then this leads to a certain phenomena that has to be controlled. There are other types of defects that come in, the defects related to solidification and defects related to uh, solidification and subsequent heating and cooling. It can be uh, cooling as well. So these occur, these arise from the stresses induced between solidified areas of the melt pool and areas yet to be solidified, right? Grain boundary cracking can take place because the two different source, uh, uh, so, uh, regions where it is uh, melting and, and it, the, the growing, then the two converge and then it can lead to some kind of a cracking because of say, the, because there is a chemical segregation around this. So this kind of cracks are quite often seen in additively manufactured materials. Then there is a swelling that takes place uh, that happens because of surface tension forces. Then the residual stresses, residual stresses are very, very important in engineering uh, products. Even in the case of normal uh, cast and uh, rot products, residual stresses have to be minimized and controlled. And here, because they're very large solidification rates or very faster cooling rate, then in that case, it is inevitable because of the thermal regions thermal gradient and then therefore uh, and then it is also on the on the substrate so all that leads to some kind of residual stresses uh, in in the material so actually to reduce the residual stresses the lower energy input and shorter scanning strips are required but again it has to be weighed against the requirement of the process then there is uh, uh, there is another way to do it is uh, to reduce the residual stresses is one can increase the preheat temperature so that the thermal gradients are minimum or shorter deposition lengths so that there is not so much of uh, the, the heat transfer is appropriate there in that case or it's almost uh, optimized and then uh, then these things can be taken care but again that affects the kinetics of the process and therefore the economics of the process now the most important thing for which metallurgists have jumped into this process is the microstructural aspects. So this additively manufactured materials lead to a very characteristic microstructures which are not so often seen in the cast and rot products. So for example, here I am showing the alloy 718, in Inconel 718, which is a very fav favorite alloy for additive manufacturing. So if one can prepare these alloys, these alloys are well known for several decades, uh, maybe Second World War, World War onwards, this was developed. So this, in the cast condition, we get a dendritic structure. Then in rod condition, we get a grains uh, in, in a certain elongated or equiaxed manner. And in the additively manufactured case, we get equiaxed grains which are elongated, but there is always a segregation around this. So the distribution of various alloying elements, in this case, at least there are five or six important alloying elements. So their distribution is not the same as in this case or in this case as in this case. Another thing that happens is uh, because of the thermal conditions, it also generates some kind of phases which may be desirable sometimes and sometimes undesirable. 
desirable means so I, as i mentioned in the beginning that sometimes the additive manufacturing gives a surprise that the properties of additively manufactured products are measured to be superior than the cast and rod products which are so well established so and processes are processes are so controlled so this happens because of the because of the precipitates or the second phases which are generally very difficult to generate in these cases they inevitably occur because of uh, the because in this case we do not do anything that suppresses the formation of these phases it's a some kind of a non equilibrium cooling so those precipitates may generate if the precipitates if those thermal conditions are suitable for generation and growth of these precipitates then one can get these precipitates sometimes they are undesirable so in that case a post deposition heat treatments are applied and therefore these precipitates are made to dissolve in the matrix and the segregation has to be minimized so but the microstructures are definitely very different and each of these three microstructures any any very basic metallurgical knowledge will also reveal that if you just subject to a simple tensile test or any fracture toughness or fatigue test all these three materials will give rise to different properties so this 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 gives us lot of window of opportunity to optimize the properties corresponding to additively manufactured microstructure so there has been a, as i mentioned earlier that there is also a map that deals with the kind of microstructure that generate that will get generated uh, in in additively manufactured materials and this is a function of if you plot thermal gradients and the growth rate then we can get from equiax to dendritic to columnar dendritic to cellular to planar and all are having as i said they have we are very very important attributes some are good for high temperature property some are good for cyclic properties some are good for uh, some other room temperature tensile strength or something so this is and this is decided by basically uh, this is thermal the ratio actually ratio of uh, thermal gradient divided by growth rate that determines the morphology of solidification structure and the product of these determines the size of solidification structure so this is a very favorite diagram for many people and uh, in 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 our in our discipline many people are working on generating such a diagram for different materials and then of course the next step is what are the consequences of these microstructures well i have already told about the heat transfer the importance of heat transfer because heat transfers can take place through conduction through substrate convection through shielded gases and the, the latter effect is more prominent in ded compared to uh, laser melted processes or powder bed processes due to high gas flow rate solidification also determines initial phase distribution and grain morphology heat source decides the speed power and size that ultimately influences melt pool geometry which determines solidification kinetics and then we have uh, the g and r parameters as we have discussed and then they 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 they, they control the solidification process and of course the microstructural aspect of it now uh, this is all that we get after processing and then what do we get uh, whether what we get after processing with all kinds of limitation that i have mentioned is suitable for use obviously no because the processes are not optimized because here the control over the process is lesser than a normal rot process or casting which we have been knowing since several decades uh, we we know even though the casting is slightly less controlled a process but we know by now how to control the structure and properties of a cast material porosity all these things are now well established because of the practice and in in immense amount of research that has gone in so the most important is post processing and the important stage comes is the substrate removal right so this this ha, these are to be removed so powder bed processes require powder to either the subjected to vacuum from the part uh, if or or blasted off if the powder, if if the process is sintering based processes like in ebm processes 
and then there is a thermal post processing that is required to relieve residual stresses porosity closure and other optimization of microstructure then porosity optimization is done by hot isostatic pressing also the internal cracks can be minimized if they are below a critical size but of course uh, it is not uh, so effective in minimizing the cracks some porosities can be taken care and then of course as i said that microstructural control like recovery recrystallization grain growth is important stress relief annealing is required because residual stresses have to be removed and then one can do it at higher temperature and uh, for short enough time so that there is no uh, appreciable microstructural change during those treatments so basically i won't uh, spend too much time on this diagram whatever i have mentioned is summarized here so all these uh, processes uh, all these different aspects of the process are covered here in this diagram and how uh, it is influenced and just i wanted to tell you the complexity the very purpose of showing this is the complexity in mix of different parameters that leads to uh, the final product and everything is everything accounts for outcomes of the process that is failed builds if it is there then it is related to you can see closely related to all these processes right similarly for mechanical properties good or bad are influenced by certain Uh, process interventions and then feature size geometrical scaling is also dependent on that so all these things are interrelated but there is a definite relationship between input parameters underlying physics and expected outcome that we expect from metal, uh, metal additive manufacturing and always remember this relationship is different for different materials so so there is a, a large canvas to work on this and believe me this is very important and i can i have been always emphasizing in all my talks that probably the rate at which aim has grown is much faster than it should have grown because many cases people are able to generate shapes or the focus of the manufacturers is to generate shapes and obvious defects people are analyzing but there are many hidden things which unless they are controlled they will lead to bad results in terms of performance so all these things have to be really optimized now i will just give you few examples quickly i think i have a, a few more minutes to talk so i will give you few examples of what we have been doing so what we have uh, worked on various uh, possibilities one is we have taken some Known material like in Cornell 718, and try to see whether we can do something better than what is reported for these materials, and understanding the uh, physics or, or metallurgy of the whole process, because this is a very important material because high temperature, owing to its high temperature capabilities, the many times it is used for uh, making turbine blades of a certain temperature range, operation in a certain temperature range. they care up to 650 degrees it's also used in nuclear and space industries for various applications and there is another possibility to use is high entropy alloy these are totally new type of alloys i don't want to get into this this is a, a, some kind of a very very complex metallurgy involved in this but whether these materials if at all with a new process we can make new types of materials that is another bonus because anyway we don't make them so well by a conventional process so whether we can do it and we have got reasonable success in this whole process just to show you i think this uh, is always available on various sources that there are various aerospace component that are used from inconel 718 uh, the the rolls royce has uh, used these components for for various applications so this uh, yep. the why aerospace industries i'm just going back and forth why aerospace industry has been focusing on uh, these materials is because of reduction in number of steps uh, reducing weight fuel increased fuel efficiency and expanding the function and application of the material and then lead time is less life cycle uh, costs are less 
but there are problems as i said the challenges are design uh, post process inspection and quantification plus there are now only there are some astm standards coming up to certify am product we cannot obviously use the same uh, certification procedures as used for conventional material so the certification for application has to be redesigned rewritten specs have to be rewritten for am products so this is what it is now uh, as i said we have i'll just pass through it because our research is mainly on microstructural evolution so we just tried to see uh, 718 which is most uh, established alloy for additive manufacturing and we try to use both ebm and uh, selective laser melting uh, for for making parts out of it making plates simply making plates out of it and then we try to see how do they differ from each other and this is a fine metallurgical observation as you will see that in 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 this case of uh, ebm your microstructures it's a, a, one need not know metallurgy to appreciate the differences but uh, visual inspection you can see that the microstructures that result from ebm and uh, slm are totally different and the the size the structural sizes are different in ebm and slm processes and as i mentioned that all these have very significant influence on on the properties of the material so so therefore uh, the, these have to be uh, suitably tailored and process has to be suitably chosen and again the respective parameters have to be optimized now we also got these precipitates which are inevitably inevitable in these high temperature alloys so we designed a process heat treatment strategy which is totally designed by us that how to do it so that you get a similar microstructure as desired for uh, uh, for a certain application so we designed all these things and then we could see that the response of the same heat treatment strategy is different for slm and ebm process material so you could see there are there are differences in properties the they they are, they are not too far but there is appreciable difference uh, even till the end or for a long term heat treatment uh, and and after all treatments there is some difference and this this have to be accounted for how we are uh, going to make and what we are going to do we work on microstructure optimization so i will not emphasize much over here it has uh, but we we could uh, we we could very clearly see the difference between e ebm and slm processes in the most optimized condition for 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 uh, for 718 and we we could tailor the desirable range for getting suitable microstructure like equiax microstructures are very highly desirable for many room temperature properties so th this this kind of microstructure has uh, special attribute of having a good combination of room temperature strength and ductility so we could hit the condition by which we can get these parameters and in other cases we have other properties which are maximized or minimized and we simply did the tensile tests and we could see the differences by before heat treatment after heat treatment i i don't want to you to pay so much of attention all these are from published literature uh, if somebody is interested i can share the information or i can share the slides as well so uh, but but one thing that i wanted uh, to bring your attention is you would see that the all curves are not converging so there are differences for example in this case after heat treatment there is a difference in am product you could see here as printed and uh, heat treated once so the, these two are heat treated so heat treatment uh, brings lot of changes in these materials and also a similar response was seen for both both the ebm and slm of course the degree was different and there were some other finer features which were a result of a faster cooling in the slm process than ebm process but this is a finer whatever Uh, those who have worked on steels they know that there is a plc effect in steel uh, which leads to serration in stress strain curve so that we could very closely monitor in, in the selective laser melted process which was absent in the case of ebm process and it has some consequence in some properties post heat treatment microstructural same heat treatment given to both the materials have led to different microstructures different location of precipitates right so all these things have would influence the uh, targeted properties definitely 
now we also could see that uh, in some cases in particularly in ebm case we could see uh, even though in the most optimized condition there was uh, more such kind of defects present than in slm process but of course we have to uh, really work little more on this uh, ebm processes we got done from somewhere our ebm unit is just getting ready so once it is done then probably we can work little more to uh, to to optimize the the most of the properties there is a thermo there is a lot of things to work with the thermodynamics and kinetics what should be the cooling rate because ebm process particularly as we say that we we get substrate heated but how much to heat and all that has to be optimized based on this diagram so we have done some calculations and we are applying it and using it for certain applications well there is segregation here which is shown here now another important aspect uh, i would just say uh, is the way we have uh, uh, we, we we build the material as i mentioned this has significant influence so here we worked on uh, 316l uh, steels and we we could see here that uh, we could see here that uh, how how the deposition was done like uh, build direction is suppose this is the build direction and builds are made in this way so we have uh, done some model samples and uh, i must acknowledge probably in the I missed out the name of one Dr. K. G. Prashant. He has made uh, from Estonia, uh, Tallinn University in Estonia. He has made these samples for us, and he has sent uh, uh, all these samples under uh, deposited under different conditions. Uh, as per uh, we systematically designed, and he has made these samples, and we we evaluated the properties of all that, and we could see here it's very very clear to see. that there is significant difference in prop microstructure and corresponding difference in properties in horizontal and vertical build we also try to change the hatch style of deposition and we would see we have applied different size of hatch style and hatch rotation so style means these directions are totally different in four quarters of the build and in this case we have just changed the alternated the directions and uh, the whole the entire system was rotated this way and we examine the solidification conditions in this and we could see a uh, different types of microstructural evolution as a function of hatch rotation as well as hatch style so that means this also if their microstructures are different so the consequence consequent properties will be different how much will be the difference that has to be assessed but if it is within significant uh, range then 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 it has to be really controlled so these parameters need to be controlled uh, these are some compression test results initial results as a function of hatch rotation so initially the yielding has taken place at a similar condition but you can see that the ultimate tensile strength uh, is totally different in all these conditions right so then we have uh, just quickly i think uh, how much time i have now amresh uh there are 25 minutes okay a few minutes i will take and then i will take up some questions yes. so they so the process now the post processing where we have little bit uh, got uh, our claim to fame in our group is post processing we have uh, systematically designed now i am switching over to uh, chi64 where we have uh, we have systematically carried out Uh, designed a heat treatment process so normally a uh, normal heat treatment for titanium 6 aluminum 4 vanadium should be like this but for additive manufacturing process uh, additively manufactured products uh, we have used a cyclic processing strategy and this was not uh, out of uh, some kind of intuition there is some we could examine the microstructure and based on that since it has a lamellar microstructure we wanted to have a globular microstructure which i will show you in the next slide and because that would give rise to the best results in 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 this condition and then we designed this strategy and then i will show you that we have got significantly 
significant properties and in fact this work was very highly appreciated in international community so because no one has done this kinds of optimization heat treatment just by heat treatment and heat why heat treatment is important because normally what we do is by additively manufacture additive manufacturing we go to a near net shape product so our turbine is exactly of this turbine blade is exactly of the shape of a turbine blade we have no further choice to make any plastic deformation or any change or any machining unless we really take into account of uh, machining allowances and all that so we don't have to do it so we have but heating and cooling we can always control so just by heating and cooling cycle if we are able to improve the performance so that is one big step in this area which we have done so this was the initial material that we got after deposition and by designing this specific heat treatment this is which is a most undesirable microstructure we could transform to this kind of microstructure or this kind of microstructure for different conditions so these these are one of the most suitable and desired ones and this had significant effect on uh, properties also here stress strain curve is shown here you could see that the heat treated ones are the triangular ones so they they have shown larger larger ductility and of course there is some reduction in strength but the ductility is significantly larger and so therefore the 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 particularly the toughness part will be uh, appreciably different in both the cases and therefore sometimes we need uh, more ductility sometimes we need more strength and accordingly by heat treatment we can tailor it another post processing thing that we have done mind it we have not done any hipping because we didn't have access to hip and uh, we always felt that hipping is not the best way to to tailor things because we hipping just does closure of porosity and it the process takes place at a very high temperature and at those high temperatures once we take the material we get more microstructural more damage to the optimized microstructure then we the benefit that we get by reducing certain fractions of porosity so we followed different methods so one was the surface mechanical attrition treatment which is some kind of a modified version of a, a traditional short peening process there we, what we do is without making significant change in dimensions of the component we we hit the surface by very small balls at a controlled frequency and we try to nano crystallize this it has many many positive effects one is it reduces compressive residual stresses as such i mentioned that residual stresses are inevitable in the process so residual stresses are generated now and we also know that if the residual stresses are compressive in nature it adds to enhanced fatigue life of the material so what we did we did uh, this this uh, surface mechanical attrition treatment that generated a thin layer a few micron thick uh, see th th this very clearly show that is about 2 micron thick layer which is nano crystalline in nature and because of compressive residual stresses the fatigue life of the component has substantially enhanced and there are always remember that additively manufactured materials are uh, characterized by a uh, generation of cracks from the porosities right collision uh, the, the collisions of porosities that leads to generation of cracks under loading conditions so in this case what we did we closed the pores at the surface so therefore the surface uh, origin the cracks which would have generated uh, at the surface were substantially minimized and this has shown substantially improved properties so this is what is the property data here so residual stresses are for example by surface mechanical attrition treatment the residual stresses are uh, very uh, minimal as we go below the depth of the surface up to up to reasonable extent up to about 200 microns and they remain uh, negative in contrast to positive residual stresses which were detrimental in as deposited condition or as manufactured condition and uh, there is increase in hardness in this case and uh, depth from the surface it decreases so basically we tailor only a small region but it has significant properties so you could see here that we have carried out uh, uh, carried out the fatigue tests on these materials 
and actually this was this is the result of corrosion fitting we have done under controlled uh, media because we wanted to examine this biocompatibility but it it will have a similar effects on uh, regular fatigue tests also you could see here that uh, this is h is the heat treated condition so this is uh, for all the three conditions you would see uh, from from here the the fatigue life substantially gets enhanced as as uh, as we go ahead with uh, with with these, these treatments like surface mechanical attrition treatments like sh here represents the case when this was supposed to be smat treated uh, horizontal and vertical builds smat treated so in this case so smat treated material is showing this curve and we could see that there is a very uh, substantial improvement this is a logarithmic scale so you can see we have not seen even uh, the, the failure has occurred almost here so the life of the material has increased uh, several several uh, tens of several powers uh, times on uh, as a result of uh, surface mechanical attrition treatment there was some improvement in terms of uh, heat treatment also but this has really led to a very good thing and we also analyze the reason for that what smat does is it changes the fracture morphology of the material and therefore the things are there then the last aspect which i am just going to tell you is uh, the work from our colleagues uh, professor dipankar banerji and uh, dr deepa srinivasan uh, who has been uh, these are slides basically borrowed from them this repair technology so a repair technology is very very important because we cannot afford to replace the components and particularly the precise components all the time uh, costly components so if we can repair it and the repaired uh, component performs in a similar way as the original component then it's all the more very good so this was done uh, for the repair of turbine blades and this work was also done in uh, collaboration with intech uh, dlms uh, this professor banerjee's work it's uh, i was not a part of it but i just wanted to show so these people they have tried to make uh, they they cut it uh, damaged blade and then try to fill it the, the damage was uh, tried to uh, deposit it the, the 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 cracks or they tried to be filled up with a new deposit and the microstructure and properties of the deposit was analyzed and it was found to be very appropriate and suitable and compatible for that and therefore the blades could be repaired uh, this was done on cm247 uh, blades and then this was successfully demonstrated microstructure of all these uh, they have also generated the new blades uh, small blades which i'll show you and microstructure was analyzed and we could see that the originally originally uh, formed blades which were uh, done by conventional method which were in service whether the microstructures are similar or different so particularly different quantitative parameters were assessed and we and it was quite satisfying that the filled in or the material that has gone as a part of repair is also as good as uh, the the original material so this is some of these results uh just uh, i will touch upon this this slide this this kind of uh, presentation was already done by my colleague kashik chatterji so bone plates as i said can be nicely designed cranial implants can be designed uh, by by additive manufacturing because these are small complicated shapes and then these can be just uh, designed can be fed in in fact the entire human body the anatomy can be uh, fed, uh, can be addressed by additive manufacturing and we also did some work in jointly with uh, professor kashik chatterji and in this case uh, the bone plate was made by additive manufacturing and we also got a bone plate made by rot process did the similar heat treatment saw whether the conventionally available or so called imported uh, bone plates from johnson and johnson uh, which is the major supplier for for orthopedic implants and whether additively manufactured materials gives the similar kind of performance or not by heat treatment we we carried out crystallographic analysis and we could do the tensile tests and we could see that additively manufactured material has higher strength lower ductility from compared to the rot material but after heat treatment 
we got almost same level of strength and ductility. So in this case, it was already we have a standard for uh, implant from rot materials, which is being imported over a period of time. And now we know that uh, we can we can do it by additively additive manufacturing and we can control the properties by tailoring the microstructure by heat treatment and all that. And then we could we could uh, assess the whole thing by different types of tests, tensile test, three point pen test, and we could see a similar performance of all that is imported. And again, we tested it whether because of one thing I must mention that additively manufactured products, they always they are little rich in oxygen because uh, whatever you do, uh, there is some oxygen pickup during this whole process. It is much more than the oxygen intake is much more than a precisely controlled casting. So whether these are uh, th these have some good attributes in terms of uh, strength, but it, it it, 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 it is it adversely affects the ductility sometimes but whether the bio but if, if we get this desired level of performance then whether we get surplus uh, property or not it doesn't matter for this this particular application it was all optimal and then we could see uh, we could see a cell growth rate uh, this was probably this is done in Professor Kaushik Chatterjee's lab. So cell growth rate on all these uh, rot materials and heat treated materials and heat treated after additively manufactured additive manufacturing and as additively manufactured material. We could see that the best condition was done on additively manufactured plus the rate of uh, cell growth was the best in additively manufactured material subjected to heat treatment even though there was slightly inferior performance of as am material but heat treatment has made it even superior than the rot product so this is what it is so in summarizing the whole thing i have uh, covered lots of aspects of it uh, my immediate take is this area requires a lot of attention because as i mentioned and i will repeat that uh, the pro here the industry is much faster than the laboratory right and then uh, we have i have my personal experience that uh, uh, we, we we ordered something to a company we got the material but the material was of uh, less of an use than uh, what we expected so there are various things that has to be worked on one is feedstock optimization this really requires a deeper scientific understanding of uh, powder metallurgy because we cannot just uh, go ahead with a 40 micron as a certifying 40 micron spherical powder as a certifying criteria. We may get a better performance if we really hit the appropriate distribution and appropriate morphology. So this has to be done. Then process optimization has to be done to minimize the defects. The two diagrams that I have shown as a function of laser power, as a function of scan speed, all these things have to be done. And such a map has to be created for each material. Like in, in, in ISC, the claim to fame of our department is to generate processing map, which was developed by uh, senior professor, Professor YVRK Prasad. He has generated a compendium of processing map of 200 engineering materials, which was published by American Society of Metals database. So it is published as the two volumes. So a similar book has to come out for all additively manufactured materials covering all the process parameters so that anyone can just take up uh, the book and take out, uh, okay, this Ti64 under this condition gives the best microstructure in this condition it gives best, def uh, best concentration of defects or elimination of defects. The whole thing is very highly desirable. So this is one thing which people have to pay attention. Our group is working, but many more groups should work in this area. Then another thing which I have not touched upon, but here I have listed it, is all these optimizations have to be done with regard to geometry of the sample, like the process parameters required for making a thicker plate and a thinner plates are different. So they, in that direction also we are working on melting, how many times remelting will help. So we are making with one layer, two layers and every layer we are examining whether the reheating during the process of buildup is making some change and what is the optimal in that case. This is also a, a very important area to work on. 
then the screening of materials the one is the choice which all material to subject to am or shall we go ahead with all possible materials for am or we should restrict our choice to so some criteria has to evolve and also which all materials are tolerant to scatter in composition there are some materials where if you deviate from local composition little bit then the properties are totally out of control so we cannot afford so we have to make sure that the material which we are processing and the segregations micro segregations are within the tolerance limit of performance of that material so this is one important thing then post processing strategies i have already emphasized that heat treatment guidelines for each of these materials have to come so if there are two two volumes or 200 uh, database or 100 database coming for processing parameter optimization another 100 uh, databases are required for all the materials or more uh, for for heat treatment guidelines and what are the property database required tensile fatigue fracture toughness high strain rate response thermal stability like creep and other things environmental susceptibility chemical and biological response so i will summarize that there is a lot to do for many people at least for next two decades even though we work at very fast pace as we are working now at least for 10 years a person like me uh, has uh, no dearth of problem in am till we retire so this is with this submission i i acknowledge all the contributors of this work my students have worked all the work that i have shown is done by my students many a times even the intellectual input came from them and uh, we just discussed it so i acknowledge all of them i have already mentioned in the beginning if some are left i, I these are included here many people collaborated uh, and 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 this is also there and of course one person i must uh, acknowledge which is professor amrish chakravarty he he gave me a lot of free hand i, I am not a permanent faculty of cpdm but i have been made the in charge of additive manufacturing facility in cpdm so uh, that he has given me full freedom to work on that so that is one thing many collaborators uh, within isc we all work as a team and we are trying to address some of these issues and of course nothing can be done if somebody doesn't pay for it so all the funding agencies which are helpful and which will be helpful in future we have we are hitting at many sources so because we have to generate a huge database and develop understanding so so all these are acknowledged thank you very much uh, this is the most pleasant photograph of isc that i have and i always would like to walk along these roads and incidentally they are very close to where we work thank you very much thank you very much for sir satyam swas was wonderful uh, people are eagerly waiting for you to ask you questions <laughs> right right the first question was uh, shot by dr manish arora himself uh, dr right. manish okay good i thought i will get in early but yeah <laughs> but i think you, you can yeah I can ask my question now. Is that okay? Yeah, please go ahead. Yes, yes, Manish, go yeah, ahead. So I was uh, wondering, you talked about a few materials, uh, Inconel and uh, Ty Ty64 and uh, one stainless steel variety. But what are the other materials which might be of interest? Uh, uh, well, uh, from engineering perspective, Manish, all materials are important. But one thing is there: the materials which are used for niche applications, like uh, uh, in titanium alloy. Our next venture is at, in two direction: in biomedical direction, along with Kaushik, we are investigating on beta titanium alloy. In fact, we have recently written a review on beta titanium alloy, and uh, there is a challenge in uh, making parts out of beta titanium alloys. So we have we are working on that. and in aerospace side of titanium alloy the most important high temperature alloy is ty6242 it's titanium aluminum zirconium molybdenum based alloy which is used in hotter section of the turbine i see for okay. both as blades as well as blisks mm -hmm. so, so both these, are... these are very important so we are working in these two new titanium alloys uh, at present ty64 uh, people have done at various uh, sectors they have they have optimized it and things are quite okay and so we are working on this uh, super alloys in 718 is again uh, quite extensively studied by others as well as us 
now we have also started a program on cm247 which is again a higher temperature capability alloy and uh, with e beam coming in uh, there is a possibility to by am to generate single crystal uh, components or single crystal blades if this is successful at a larger scale it will revolutionize the entire turbine technology so I that see. also we have started working on. So let us see how much we succeed. Yeah. And apart from uh, process optimization, I think the feedstock generation also is a challenge in these areas, sir. Yes, powder, powder, uh, powder feedstock. So for that, as uh, uh, some of you are aware, we have put up a proposal to have a, a system where we can have a proper powder uh, 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 technology to generate for all the desired application because you cannot use the same technology for copper aluminium and titanium or nickel uh, for, for all the cases so we are working on these lines yeah okay thank you okay there are many more questions yeah yes yes uh next would be i'm just trying to go in sequence so that uh, uh mr tanmay data May please ask the question, or can I read uh, it? Hello, am I audible? Yeah, please, please go ahead. Oh, yes, uh, I wanted to ask. Uh, you mentioned about high entropy alloys. Uh, right. So, uh, what what would be the challenges to make the powders uh, out of high, high entropy alloys? Uh, actually, uh, making powders of high entropy alloy itself is a challenge because uh, uh, we have to have first of all we have to make a alloy and then we have to when you solidify when when you produce atomized powders of it uh, first of all if their uh, atomization is a challenge and then segregation because high entropy alloy is supposed to perform a solid solution for a certain composition range the moment you deviate from that local microchemistry you do not have the single phase as desired in many cases so in that case that itself is a challenge so but but for certain cases people have optimized it and if at all, so we are also working on uh, high entropy alloys where we are just taking elemental powders and uh, we are mixing it and then we are melting it so that there we are expecting a better, uh, a be better uh, compositional homogeneity in, in all these cases. Is, thank if you. If that is successful, it will be a great thing to do. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Basuraj Ishwar. Uh, I, I also would like to say that uh, I have to join another very important meeting at 5. So I will take up a question and otherwise I am quite open for uh, you. You can write a mail to me. I will definitely respond. OK, that leaves us only with uh, one minute. Yeah. <laughs> so may I request uh, uh, Dr. Manish Arora to propose vote of thanks and other questions we'll uh, take up offline. Sure, it's, it's my pleasure to propose a vote of thanks for Professor Satyam Suhas, who has been kind enough to share his knowledge with us today, uh, extensive knowledge and uh, enlightened us, uh, enlightened us on, on the various Hello. aspects of. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I was, I was saying that uh, thank you, Professor Satyam Sahas. Yes, for giving. Yes, yes. Uh, that, uh, I think we all enjoyed and we learned a lot. And I, I, I completely agree that there is plenty to do in this area and motivate our students to take up research in this area so that some of those challenges can be can be met. And uh, I hope we'll have that compendium of material uh, process parameters, as you're saying, for AM uh, pretty soon. Yes, yes, that will be interesting to have. That is the have. most desired one. And our recent proposal, uh, submitted where you are a co-investigator aims yeah. towards that yes, at least for few materials yes indeed. we look forward to, to working on such things, such things thank you so the rest of the questions in view of time we will take it over we'll send right. it to so you, can, you can send a list of questions i think uh, dr madhusudan srinivas yes. madhusudan yes. you can send me a question a list and i will i will uh, reply to that yeah, thank, thank you very you. much thank you for yeah. your uh, patient uh, listening to my talk even though it was little uh, uh, 
longer than what I expected and I planned for. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. With Thank this, you. I am closing the session. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.